I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and I'd like to welcome you to this wonderful panel. Uh, I'm very excited about it, and uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, I just want to start by saying the following, that when I finished reading uh, Susan Fisher Sterling's exacting, and they were exacting words uh, in the foreword with the app title, Off the Wall, and when I finished Todd Alton's resolute essay, Transformation Event Context, Eva Hesse, 1965, I found myself in a state of major anxiety. And uh, I was really anxious by these uh, two pieces of writing. And then I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this absolutely glorious catalog and Eva Hesse's genius um, that is coming after this. And I'm starting to think, all right, what, what's going on here uh, with these two pieces of work? Susan's um, statement and question, Eva Hesse was a painter in 1962. She was talented and she loved painting and drawing, so how is it that four years later she would become one of the first and best post-minimalist sculptors? And Todd's observation, the asymmetry of Hesse and Doyle's art world positions, then and now, is the elephant in the room of many accounts of Eva Hesse's career development. And these are but two of the points that were world-winding for me as a departure into the vortex of relationship, creation, gender, disparity, and the pains and pleasures, of course, of artistic evolution. Omission, commission. So I had to sort of stop there and take a very deep breath and um, thought to myself how fitting to be able to make opening remarks today because it is because of this vortex that we have and it is the why and wherefore of the Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And it's really a very fitting and it exacting and exciting opportunity because today's panel discussion, um, Eva Hess, 1965, is, uh, marks the sixth anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. So I'm particularly delighted about that. Um, comes to mind a cliche, and I don't like cliches, and an advertisement, but there it goes. The more things change, the more they stay the same and you've come a long way, baby. So I think a lot of that, I think there's feedback happening here. Yeah, we all right? Um, so, so the Eva Hess in 1965 reveals, um, as Todd said, the elephant in the room. And I, I feel like we have to um, revel in your reveal. I know that Barry Rosen revels in this reveal, and I will join him. He's generalizing uh, on this very specific, uh, not to mention gorgeousness, uh, is the book's success in universalizing female artists' experience, uh, hence the feminist art discourse. And Hess's debut as a sculptor that year was, as T Todd noted, in a single loose leaf folded insert in her husband Tom Doyle's catalog. And this is profound and it's startling image, especially in hindsight. Yet, 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 the shared studio space in Germany in 1965 cannot be overlooked and um, their relationship. And this segues me into a tip of the hat to uh, Catherine Morris, the curator of the Sackler Center, who's here as well. And uh, she's expanded conversations uh, of the content of feminist art, of theory, of culture, of philosophy, and of activism to all art, whether contemporary or ancient, and whether male or female. And so we have come a long way, baby, and we have miles to go before we sleep. Today um, brings together friendships, 
and colleagues, intellectual, artistic, and cultural goals. Uh, and it's a moment for me of, revela of revelation as much as it is of celebration. And um, I celebrate, and where is she? Uh, Rebecca Taffel, who without her, she is the program, uh, director of programming at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. Without her foresight and enthusiasm, um, this panel wouldn't be happening. And I want to thank you very much, Rebecca. We all owe you a nod of approval and appreciation. I thank you for that. My love and thanks, of course, also to Barry Rosen for bringing to life great books, great ideas, great art, and great friendship. And thank you, Barry. Helen Cherish is here with us, um, and I'm delighted that she is Ava's uh, sister. And I said, oh, well, she's cherished the Cherish has cherished <laughs> Eva Hess's um, oeuvre and her memory. And uh, we owe a gratitude of debt to you as well, Helen. And it's our good fortune today, of course, to have Elizabeth Sussman, a Gilman Curator of Photography at the Whitney Museum of American Art as moderator. And um, a pleasure, a true pleasure to have our panelists, Todd Alden, to immediately to my right, Susan Fisher-Sterling, Kirsten Swenson, and of course, William Wilson. And Elizabeth will be introducing uh, the panelists uh, when I'm finished. So I will now formally begin having unloaded myself of the angst, anxiety, and anxiousness produced by thinking about all of the things that there are to think about um, in the world of creation and creativity and art. Our panel coincides, well not exactly because it just closed, with the exhibition of the same name, Eva Hesse in 1965, which was at Hauser and Worth in London. The Yale University Press publication, uh, which accompanied the exhibition, will be more widely available um, this summer, and it is from that publication, Eva Hess 65, that we owe um, a debt to our writers and to our panelists today. Both the exhibition and publication of Eva Hess 1965 reconsiders Eva Hess's legacy by focusing on the transitional year of 1965. Hess is considered a sculptor, but started as a painter. The exhibition and the Yale publication offers a new perspective on how and why she made the transition from painting to sculpture in 1965, points that have not been fully explored in other Hesse scholarship. Elizabeth Sussman, our moderator, has curated and co-curated a score, probably easily, of exhibitions including the 2012 Whitney Biennial, the award-winning Paul Tick Diver, a retrospective, William Eggleston, Democratic Camera, Photographs and Video in 1961 to 2008, and Gordon Mata Clark, You Are the Measure, to name but a few. Elizabeth has organized many Whitney exhibitions since 1993, and that year's biennial, right? Uh, including Remote Viewing, Invented Worlds and Recent Paintings and Drawings, Mike Kelly, and um, David Armstrong and Keith Herring in 1997. There's a very long list. On Eva Hesse, Elizabeth co-curated two exhibitions, one of Hesse's drawings at the Drawing Center and a glorious exhibition of Eva Hesse's sculpture at the Jewish Museum here in New York in 2000, also in 2006, um, as well as the Hesse retrospective in the Wiesbaden Museum in Wiesbaden, Germany. She's the author of many publications, has taught at MIT and Tufts, and is here to moderate this discussion. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Sussman and our panel, and thank you very much for being here today and celebrating, uh, in this way, the sixth anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope this is working. Um, Thank you, Elizabeth, for all your support in opening this wonderful center, which is um, just has been so strong and powerful and will continue to be of immense importance, I think, to all of us in our field going forward. 
So, and to the many, many um, friends I have in the audience who have been with me for this long, long journey that I've been fortunate enough to have with Eva Hess. Um, today belongs to people that, uh, one of whom, Bill Wilson, actually knew Eva Hess, which I did not. And uh, the others are people who have thought about her a great deal and who we are indebted to for very, very fresh looks at her work that are published in the wonderful book that Elizabeth referred to and that you can actually see a copy of around here. Um, I just wanted to start um, by talking briefly about this year that the exhibition in London at Hauser and Worth focuses on, which is um, the year or over a year that Hesse spent in Germany, which will be the topic of this afternoon's talks. And I wanted to, um, to bring to the conversation just a few thoughts that I had thinking about this. Um, and they come from um, somewhat of a biographical point of view, which I don't think the other talks will share. Um, but I want to mention the two things that I think are very, very important to think about with her in 1965-66. Uh, and the first one has to do with her own family. And the second one has to do with the Scheidt family, the family that invited Tom Doyle and Eva Hess to Germany. So um, on the one hand, as you all know, um, Hesse was born in Germany and had left under the uh, circumstances of the Nazification of Germany and the, what became the Holocaust. And her family had uh, lived through this, and I'm not going to go into that history at all, only to say that before she left on this return, which was the first return that any of her family had made to Germany in 65, her father wrote her uh, very detailed and specific letters, which I've read some of. And they, they are very uh, clinical and clear and directive. And they, in the background of these letters, is the fact that the Hesse family left and that along with many, many people at this moment, they were going to be able to, to receive reparations from from Germany. But this, ha in order to receive reparations for what they had been through, that is to have some of their financial loss restored to them, they were going to have to do a little bit of investigation and um, documentation of their losses. And that this was Eva's responsibility because she was the first person back there. And so he very specifically put together a list that she had to go to the hometown of her mother. She should have to go to visit the people still living in that hometown that knew her mother and her mother's family. She had to visit the family store. And he goes on through several uh, groups of people still living in Germany and Holland that had been involved in the so-called <laughs> escape from Germany that Hesse and her family had been through and that she should make recontact with when she was there. And actually, um, some of this she actually did. So this was not the thing that occupied her entirely, of course, as you're going to hear. There was lots to occupy this enormously a talented young woman. But it was in the background of what she was trying to do, pick up these pieces of her family that, um, and, and to, to, to uh, put somehow this story back together. So that was one background thing I wanted to call attention to. The other one is the, to the person who invited her. And this is uh, Scheidt, Arnhard Scheidt, who at this point, when you will encounter him in today's talks, is, will emerge as a philanthropist, the person who invited her over. And he was, at, in point of fact. But actually, Arnhard Scheidt was also um, one of the most established and, in a way, a very, very wealthy, successful person whose family had lived in this particular town in Kettwig, Germany, on the Ruhr since the early 18th century. And um, the, the uh, contrast between the, the Scheidt family um, in Kettwig and the Hesse family leaving under these circumstances were the sort of background to Hesse's experience. And um, I think that um, the environment obviously didn't produce the art, but it does form a sort of tapestry, a landscape, an actual 
place that she was living and thinking about on a daily, regular basis. And um, I think it's, it's, a, um, it's those sort of tangible parts of history that I think we have to mix in a little bit with the art history to try to plummet the great depth of Eva Hesse. So without further remarks of my own, I want to introduce all the panelists briefly, and then they will um, each talk for 10 minutes. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from Susan Fisher, who is um, the um, director of the, um, is it the official title is the Museum National, National Museum of Women's Art, and who has, um, of women in the art, sorry, and who in, who, in whose collection there are actually some notable as a pieces that she will maybe reference. Um, she's a writer herself and has written on Brazilian postmodernism and feminist photography, and has worked on Karen May Weems, one of my favorite artists, and Sarah Charlesworth and Alice Neal, all my favorite artists. So congratulations, and I look forward to hearing you. Uh, next, I think, have we decided, will be? Um, I'm last. Oh, you're last, okay. So I think next, actually, is Todd. Um, Todd is, lives in New York and is the director of, of Alden Projects. He has written extensively on Marcel Broders and is currently working on an exhibition um, about Broders. He has also written, interestingly, about Sonic Youth. I'd love to know more about that. And um, Lee Lozano, so thank you for coming. Uh, then Kirsten Swenston, who um, I was actually lucky enough to know when she was working in, at the Whitney and who helped me a great deal when I was trying to do too many things at the same time. She is now an assistant professor of contemporary art and aesthetics at UMass in Lowell. And she is writing, I'm so glad to hear, on um, Eva Hess and Saul Lewitt, uh, a book that she's calling Irrational Judgments, which we look forward to. And then finally, uh, the respondent to today's panel will be uh, William Wilson, who I have been fortunate enough to know for the many years I have worked on Hesse. He uh, knew Eva Hesse um, throughout the period under discussion today, but also before and after that. And he has written about Hesse and lectured about her many times, as well as, as other artists, and principally the artist, maybe not principally, but major work on the artist, Ray Johnson. So I think we're going to start with Susan, who's going to talk from the podium. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations and happy birthday to the Sackler Center. It's just great to be here on the sixth anniversary. I enjoyed also being here for the fifth. Okay, let's see. Perfect. Always good. So I thought I would try and set the stage a little bit for you to uh, talk about Eva Hesse's Metamorphosis in 1965. Um, I thought you'd like to see what uh, Ketvig and de Roer actually looks like now, from thanks to Google Maps and also to show you a couple of images of the, uh, on the, uh, your lower left of what the factory would have looked like <coughs> some years ago, and then on your lower right, the women working in the Zanella factory when the factory was uh, in operation. Uh, 97 women who worked in the Mädchen, who worked in the factory and lived in the Mädchenheim, the women's housing, uh, that was on the Scheidt factory property. Um, I also show you in the middle a beautiful image of the entry uh, to that factory, and it is now available for condos, in case you would like to buy a condo there. It also is used right now as a, as a space for art, and so some of the pur pur purposing that it was used uh, when in uh, Doyle and Hess's time as artists' residents uh, continues to the present day. Um, 
In setting the stage, we are recognizing uh, today that 1965 uh, marks a turning point in Ava Hess's work when, as Elizabeth said, both Elizabeths have said, she moves from being a, a painter uh, to, in her artistic practice toward becoming a sculptor. Um, a couple of comments on that. When she went to um, Germany, she went as the artist's wife. It was Tom Doyle, as uh, I think Todd will talk about, who was really the, per the artist who was asked to come uh, to be part of the residency. And Doyle was supportive of having his uh, wife, Ava Hesse, be part of that and be treated properly as an artist as well. Uh, the first eight months that she spent in Ketvig an der Röhr uh, was the time when she really started that critical revisioning of what I feel was to some degree her New York myopia. Uh, she had an opportunity to travel, and I wish that I had had time to put a, do a, a, a map, a stitch map perhaps, of all the places, or a dot map, of all the places that she was able to go to. Uh, and I know that Todd will probably talk a bit more about that as well. So uh, I wanted to ask a few questions. How many of you in the audience know Ava Hess's uh, work well, or know Ava Hess's work? Okay, great. And how many of you know the early work? And how many of you are Hess scholars? Okay, so this should be okay. Because what I thought I would do is I thought I'd do a, a, a run through of the, of the time, uh, the critical time that she was in uh, Germany and the works that uh, she produced there. So I'd like to quickly look at the three main bodies of work. And this really is what I would call a screenshot show. We're going to look first at what she did in 1962. She's thinking, she's, she and her husband are both abstract expressionists, or that's how they refer to themselves. This is Hesse in 64. Also 64. Where she starts to create a set of works that are drawings and paintings of more contained forms. And then here's where she starts to go. With those, uh, with those works. The next works that you'll see are very different uh, from what the abstract expressionist paintings look like. And uh, what we'll see revolves around the use of machine-like forms and what I would call simple mechanics. When we look at these contained form works, and this personage in the middle just looks like totally is, looks to me like a woman who is showing all her goodies. It's just a wah sort of work. And I, I would love to be able to have spent time analyzing all the uh, imagery in these contained forms. But uh, let's just take a look at a, a few of them. Oh, by the way, I mean, don't fail to notice the penis-like form on one side and this woman-like form with, which looks like an opening of vagina in the middle. It's all, it's all very relevant and important. When I look at these works, what I think about is the use of the machine pieces. You have body parts or their suggestions. And it reminds me an awful lot to some degree of, I don't know if you all remember Picasso's Dream and Lie of Franco, that series of etchings that is like a storyboard. But it also reminds me of the Cadavra Esquiz game that the surrealists uh, would play uh, when they would take a piece of a drawing and then the next person wouldn't see the drawing and would add something else and then another person would add something else. Um, all these pieces don't necessarily uh, fit together, but she creates separate pictorial worlds for each of her images. And then it's up to us to try and put the uh, meaning to it uh, of what she created pictorially. And a lot of the forms that you see in these works will come to bear on uh, images that she, or objects that she creates starting in uh, late 1965 and 1966. So it's 
uh, great to take a, a look at this. I also wish uh, that someone would take a look at the importance of perhaps European pop art on uh, this uh, uh, work of uh, Hesse's. I think of the way Adami uh, created uh, different sorts of uh, split or uh, elided images. So the next pieces, uh, I wanted to also show you another set of works that uh, starts with a painting like No Title, where you have this uh, very diffuse kind of uh, uh, drawing. But then somehow in some of the drawings, those kinds of images that were once floating images become much larger and cropped. And then there are images that even look like uh, the, the actual objects are floating in space, perhaps a reference to her own studio. Objects that look like lights in other uh, forms of, in a, in, a, in a space that could be uh, uh, constructed as being uh, an actual space that's been pictorialized. And then these uh, mechanized figures. So we have figures that look like sculpture. We have uh, some drawings like this of mechanisms that are, that are in action. We have drawings of spaces. And then we also have drawings of pseudo-organic objects. And these pseudo-organic objects especially have a very uh, interesting symbiotic relationship with the reliefs. Are all these images familiar to you? OK. So just quickly, uh, the reliefs, uh, one of the things about the, uh, these uh, relief sculptures is the physical labor of them. And I think that's a big difference that we should think about when we uh, talk about the relief sculptures, that there was actually some uh, uh, heavy lifting that Hesse had to do, where the drawings were very fluid, and they were something that she uh, was able to uh, do many, many of. When it came to these actual reliefs, there was a lot of physical uh, uh, intent and a lot of uh, strength that she needed to do to create them. And very likely she created them laying down so that she could screw things in and tighten things up and move things around and then make holes and, and all the like. Uh, I know someone will talk about Ring Around the Rosie because it tends to be uh, seen as a generative work. These were begun at the suggestion, or at least we, uh, as we understand it, the reliefs were begun at the suggestion of uh, Tom Doyle, her husband. And she keeps a meticulous record of these pieces as they move along. Um, he says, he, at least the way he describes it, uh, he talked with her about trying to use the uh, materials, the detritus that was in the um, factory to create these works. And I did want to go back. When you look at this work here, I know it's not called sea clamp blues, but this object underneath here that looks like a sea is actually a, that kind of clamp, that sea clamp. These are very, these are very different than the drawings uh, because they have that relief quality to them. And I just thought it was great to take a look. You have the first set of images that she does from about 19 uh, March uh, through June 65 that are much more anthropomorphized, that maybe have a single abstract object in them, that have lots of color or are partial images. And then starting in July with works like uh, this, she really develops with a much higher degree of abstraction and then fewer and simpler objects till she gets to cool zone which is the least compelling image pictorially, but the most successful if you think of it as a sculpture. And that's just because the piece is a gear and a rope that is completely relieved of any pictorial background. And then this last work, which I'm actually wearing close to the color of the work that's on the left, the left-hand side on the, in the picture of Eva Hesse, um, I just wanted to say that it would be more than a year before she would begin to embrace the serial form. 
and also the grid, and it would not be till 67 before she started to work with latex. But even so, when she created the pieces that uh, you've seen on the screen so far, um, in 1965, she really was coming to what I would call an awkward understanding of the bodily mechanics of what her compositions required. And actually, by body mechanics, I also mean the physicality that it took to create the reliefs, moving from drawing uh, into sculpture. And when she talks about the works uh, of the, uh, especially the, the relief sculptures, she talks about them in words like dumb and nonsensical, crazy, weird, and absurd. But through that, those sorts of works, it's really true that she took those steps uh, that took her work off of the drawing table and then off of the wall. Anyway, I'd like to thank Elizabeth Sackler for making this uh, panel happen and for having me here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm glad Susan showed some of those works from, um, from Germany because um, the fact remains, this is, these are obviously um, uh, death notices. That one on the left is from the Village Voice and that's the New York Times on the right. And uh, Eva Hesse, when she died and to this day, basically is remembered mostly as being having been a sculptor who made, you know, who made work in in, uh, in new materials and in uh, non non art materials. And uh, the fact of the matter is, um, no, she started out as a painter. And you know, the question remains: how did how did a painter end up making all these such incredible um, sculptures? And it didn't come out of nowhere. And the fact of the matter is a lot of the works, you know, these works that were done from when she, before she, before 1966, and this is the work here in the middle there, this is Hang Up from 1966, which she thought of as her first kind of successful work. Um, uh, you know, basically has the same tension between the two and three dimensionality that a lot of the German reliefs have. Um, but this work that she made, that she's famous for, the sculptor, didn't kind of come out of nowhere. It came out of these days from, you know, from, from, well, from having been in Germany. This is, these are, these are um, this is Repetition 19, uh, the third version of which was, which was in fiberglass, was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art uh, during her life. And this, of course, is um, Lucy Lepard's book, which is, Lepard, of course, was, was the defining, was, it, was, was the defining historian for Hesse. This book came out in 1976, and uh, she was obviously friends with Eva. And this, was, this book ended up was basically one particular take on Eva Hesse's work, um, significantly de defined through the lens of the minimalists that she was herself friends with. Um, and from here, um, she obviously also organized the eccentric abstraction show in 19. Uh, 66 that Hesse was in. Um, so Hesse, so I wanted to um, just start reading from my, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous here, apologies there, but I'm going to start reading from um, my essay here, which is in the book, which no one's read, so I thought I'd just, just have a go from here. Um, so here we have, this is uh, Lucy Lepard's uh, Eva Hesse, the famous book. Sometimes it's good for an, for an American artist to get out of America, Lucy R. Lepard wrote in the opening line of a 1965 catalog essay published at the time of Eva Hesse's first museum exhibition at the Kunsthalle Dusseldorf. At the time Lepard wrote this, she could not possibly have known from New York just how fitting this description would really prove to be for Eva Hesse. Quote, I have a real sense of freedom here, Lepard continues, quoting her subject, to try anything and I'm happy about what happens. The studio is alive with things going up all around. Lepard's subject in 1965 said, however, her subject was not Eva Hesse. It was American sculptor Tom Doyle, Hesse's husband. Now, legions of black ink have been spilled about what could be called Eva Hesse's traumatography. 
escaped from Nazi Germany in 1938 by a kinder transport to Holland, age two, the murder of many family members by the Nazis, her parents' divorce in 1944, her mother's suicide in 1945, her husband's noted drinking and philandering, Hess's protracted illness culminating in death from a brain tumor in 1934, and so on. Battalions of black ink have also been spilled, conflating the relationship between Hess's life and art. Confusion in which the artist's last interview, published just weeks before her death, appeared only to encourage. But is this approach really sufficient for grappling with uh, the intricate contradictions, infinite play, and absurd eccentricities of Eva Hess's body of work? Well, I do, well, I, so this is, um, this is uh, her, Tom Doyle there. Oops, I just clicked ahead. That's Tom Doyle, uh, her husband there on the left. And that's obviously what it is. Well, I do not propose that we turn a blind eye to the traumatic punctures, pressures, and wounds of German history in general, or to the knowable facts of Eva Hesse's actual history in particular, including the anxiety she's said to have had in returning to the vicinity of so much family trauma 20 plus years earlier. This essay attempts to examine the artistic and professional context of the artist's return to Germany in 1964 and 65, together with Tom Doyle, suggesting that the actual facts point to one inescapable conclusion, the European sojourn was filled with idiosyncratic discoveries, unusual access to European art and its professional network, extraordinary introductions, exceptional working conditions, exhibition opportunities, sales, all of which exerted a transformative impact upon the artist's work and professional direction. The asymmetry of Hesse and Doyle's art world positions, then and now, is the elephant in the room of many accounts of Hesse's career development. In her last interview, Hesse remembers Doyle, now remember he was eight years older than her, so that was quite a big difference, with considerable understatement as having been, quote, a more mature and developed artist. Mostly forgotten today, Doyle enjoyed a very different position during his rising years together with Hesse in 1961 and 1965. He went on to become a Dwan Gallery artist during the mid-1960s. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I went too fast or too slow. He, he wanted to become a major Dwan Gallery artist during the mid-1960s, because this, this clicker only goes forward. Um, so I've got to be careful. I'm not sure if I'm beyond or, or, or before. But anyway, uh, Doyle was a, went on to become a Dwan Gallery artist in the mid-60s, which, is, if, if you don't know, Dwan was sort of the place, especially for the, for the minimalists. Um, uh, during the 90s, showing alongside many of Hesse's closest friends and peers, and it was a place where she felt she belonged. And in fact, she, you know, she, she wrote in her diaries, Dwan is my whole life, and you know, Virginia Dwan doesn't take me seriously uh, as an artist. And uh, what is more, um, Doyle had participated in multiple signal exhibitions of minimalism just before returning to America, including Kinison McShine's uh, primary structure show at the, German, at the Jewish Museum in 1966. Even prior to the German sojourn, however, Doyle had been included in the dialogue shifting New Forms, New Media, uh, one and two exhibitions at the Martha Jackson Gallery. And it's shown repeatedly at Alan Stone in New York where the couple met at, the, at Doyle's first one person exhibition in 1961. Now, that last slide, which is not up, actually shows, uh, which I can't go back to, but um, one of Hesse's, the first item on her biography was a show at the Brooklyn Museum, in fact. Um, so it's, a, it's a little sort of coming full circle here. This is a poster from Tom Doyle from 1967, and he had shows in 67 and 66 uh, at Dwan. But he also had showed at, um, he also had shown at uh, the Allen Stone Gallery, which was a, at the time was an abstract expressionist gallery. And they met, in fact, at a Tom Doyle opening at the gallery. And according to Doyle, it was through him that uh, Alan Stone came to her studio, and that's how she ended up having her first show, which is, uh, this is her show of drawings from 1963 at the Alan Stone Gallery. This is a, actually happens to be addressed to Jules Olitsky. Um, but, uh, um, so anyway, um, at the earliest stages, both Doyle and Hesse had one foot in the door, at least one foot in the door of abstract expressionism. Both artists' works work, both artists work transformed, however, in Germany. But Doyle's work was by no means an easy fit with the minimalists with whom he later exhibited. 
His large-scale abstract sculptures were described in 1965 as, quote, a valid strain of romanticism, connecting him with de Suvero and Al Held, but also with Fre Frederick Kiesler. Quote, I love bridges like Walt Whitman loved animals, Doyle told Lepard. Acknowledging the facts of Doyle's professional presence, impact, and even instrumentality for Hesse, inconvenient for some, does not diminish Hesse's private and hard-won achievements, but allows us to understand something closer to the actual coordinates of intentions within the arc of Hesse's artistic development in Germany. This includes an acutely self-aware competitiveness that she had understandably felt with the older, more experienced rising sculptor, making vertically inclined masculine art in what was already so much a man's world. The extent of Doyle's actual role in nurturing her early art and experimentation, and dare I say this out loud, Doyle's early influence, not to mention his role as a foil or artistic countertype for Hesse, remains, critically speaking, an unweeded garden. What is more, other, con in other inconvenient facts about Hesse's life and art have been under-registered. Some have been ignored because they do not fit neatly into dominant narratives of Hesse as wound, which I hope part of this talk uh, does some work uh, against um, extending. Other facts about Hesse's European encounters have been, have been simply left out because they were not witnessed or shared by any of her New York contemporaries whose own exposure to, uh, in America was strikingly different. What set uh, Hesse's European experience apart from all of her New York contemporaries with whom she would later be officially associated, LeWitt, Andre, Bachner, Smithson, or even her unofficial friends, including Michael Todd, Paul Tech, Peter Hujar, Joe, Joe Raphael, and Jean Swenson, was the fact that she was more deeply immersed in the European modern and contemporary strains of art and art history that differed from American vantages. Some of Hesse's European contacts and encounters have remained until recently mostly unearthed, unknown, or underaccounted for by her, her current audiences. Um, fast forwarding, particularly intriguing is Hesse's fraternity with uh, the historically minded Harold Simon, who was the curator of the famous uh, When Attitudes uh, Become Form show from 1969, which would have made her an su international superstar. Um, well, to some degree, anyway. Early on, Zeman had organized a number of Dada-related exhibitions, including mechanical, serial, and diagrammatic works. Although it preceded her European visit, Zeman proceed, uh, produced a catalog for a Picabia exhibition uh, in 1962, and during her stay uh, in, in Germany, organized an exhibition of her Yale teacher, Joseph Albers, in 1964. Zeman also hosted her, her, the first major retrospective of Duchamp's ready-mades, including the newly reissued editions published by Arturo Schwartz in 1964. The rare opportunity for Hesse to encounter a version of Duchamp's bachelor machine and the other mechanical erotic contraptions firsthand, not to mention the Marchand Ducelle's punning inventory, is worth further consideration, and particularly so with regard to the timing of the Duchamp exhibition from 1964. Hesse had begun, only begun, had begun her pen and ink drawings in which her mechanic, erotic and mechanical parts were conjoined by a deadpan mechanical line, and that's Mignon and Nixon's, uh, only in, 19, in February 1965. So basically, she went to the Duchamp show, and whether it's a coincidence or not, uh, she, started, she started making her own kind of works with, that were, had many punning titles and which were deeply indebted to uh, mechanical, erotic uh, combinations. Duchamp's signal influence of, on Hesse, of course, has been widely acknowledged. In, in, 19, in October 1964, the same month that Duchamp's show opened in Bern, Hesse had also noted seeing Tanglee's fantastic, absurd, Duchamp-inspired machines in Basel, followed by an all-night party. Although she missed seeing Warhol's debut exhibition at Castelli in 1964, the following month Hesse traveled to, the, to Berlin to see the Neue Realisten and Pop Art show, where she saw, among others, Duchamp, Armand, Klein, and Dubuffet, paired with Johns, Oldenburg, Warhol, and Lichtenstein. European and American, juxtapositions, European and American juxtapositions that, overall, would have been impossible to see in an American receptions of pop. In other words, what Hesse saw in Germany was an experience that all of her minimalist and post-minimalist friends you know, did not, didn't see, for, except for the ones that were traveling. 
Um, Hesse had her fair share of serendipitous encounters, too. Within the space of three days in June 65, Hesse notes, one, meeting the lady in 1965 who made the fur-lined teacup, and that's obviously Merit, Merit Hock Oppenheim, traveling to Colmar with Sigmar Polka to see Grunewald's Isenheim altarpiece, and three, taking the night train to Amsterdam uh, to an opening at the Stedelijk to see James Baldwin's Amen Corner, a play after which she, she, quote, sat next to all evening James Baldwin. I was thrilled, went to party after party for the cast. Um, so when, when you look through all the date books from 1965, you see that while, while there are all these narratives of Ava Hesse as wound and Ava Hesse as constantly being a sick person, when you really look at the facts on the ground, this was a woman who was filled with life and while these may have been her conscious uh, writings in her, in, her, in her own private notebooks, this is a woman who, had a, who lived, who burned with a hard gem-like flame and had a very beautiful and, in, in many ways, life-affirming existence. Um, and I hope that more work is done towards looking this, at this other side uh, of, of Hesse's work uh, in her life. Um, how did Hesse end up returning to Europe? Rewind to 1964. The circumstances leading up to Hess's European sojourn were set in motion by Al Held, uh, Doyle's friend who'd recommended a studio visit from a group of visiting collectors and museum curators in Switzerland and Germany. According to Doyle, uh, Arnold Rudlinger, the curator from the Kunsthalle Basel, offered Doyle a museum show on the spot. Due to the difficulties of transporting Doyle's large-scale sculptures across the ocean, uh, collector uh, Friedrich Arnhard Scheidt, who we heard about earlier, uh, was also present at the studio visit and invited Doyle as an alternative to use one of his buildings in Ketvig, which were conveniently also had the same type of bluestone slabs which the artist had been working. It was evidently cheaper to import Doyle than his sculptures for which Scheidt had proposed trading provisions and lodging, etc. Once Doyle arrived in Germany, however, the artist stayed, strayed from his original plans to use stone there, preferring to use instead the steel and welders at his disposal at Scheidt's factory to explore making large-scale constructions out of wood and painted steel. Although Hesse was included in the invitation to work in Germany, Tom was the original draw. Hesse recalls, um, as Lucy Lepard recalled, was thrown in as a lagniap. Um, that's not to take anything away from Ava Hess, obviously, but the point is Tom was a huge star, and she, what she as, Le, as Lepard herself remembers, uh, e even to Lucy Lepard at that moment, Ava, Eva Hesse was Tom's wife to her. She only, she only began seeing her uh, differently when, when, when she returned to New York. Um, Rudlinger, anyway, didn't end up liking uh, Tom Doyle's new sculptural direction, but Scheidt was open to the new experiments, and so was Harold Simon, then the director of the Kunsthalle Bern, where the show wound up. What we did not mention earlier is that Doyle fell into some luck with the change of venue. Simon fit Doyle into a three-section uh, conceptual exhibition, positioning the young sculptor within an historical lineage, following, quote, three pioneers of contemporary art joined with the constructivist element of Joseph Albers. The catalog was jointly titled Marcel Duchamp, Vasily Kandinsky, Kazimar Malievich, Joseph Albers, Tom Doyle, <laughs> and contains an essay by Tsimon. Doyle presented six sculptural abstractions which the Swiss curator brilliantly identified as, quote, the creation of colorful places. And I was just, I was rereading that earlier and I thought, you know, if Hesse's complete uh, eschew eschewing of color later in, the, later in her life, I wonder, I just wondered personally if that had something to do. Tom, she, Doyle says that he, she helped her immensely with color and uh, I wonder whether her, her, her eschewing of color had something to do with, uh, with Tom's uh, affirmation of color uh, in that work that they, had, they made while they were together. Anyway, Doyle's extraordinary good fortune in being the young sculptor sharing a historically themed stage with the, the titans of 20th century abstraction, including Hesse's Yale mentor, Joseph Albers, must have made an impression. Um, so this here is, uh, this is the insert from the catalog, the, uh, the, cat the, 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 the Tom Doyle catalog that was printed in 1965 that Lucy Lepard wrote the essay for. And um, this is a four page, it's a fold out, 
And what's interesting about this is uh, you know, the difference between the way the two, the two artists chose to be identified. You know, Doyle in the first photograph, he's, got, he's, got, he's doing man's work, and he's, it's very much of a, it's very much of a, of a, you know, a male uh, looking um, pose, where this is just very, this is completely not the way a formal painter was, was to be pictured with their art at this particular time. This completely violated the photographic codes. And the, you can see the way that she's holding um, Ring Around a Rosie here, um, this, the painting right in front of her with her, with her legs o wide open. And you've got this sort of the cross between the machine and the erotic uh, and it's this, in this very sort of in your face way. And um, obviously, my take is, uh, while I believe that it was certainly important that she was reading Simone de Beauvoir at the moment right before that she was making this, I think it's also important for people to remember that she had just seen the Duchamp show and had probably just been familiarizing herself with Picabia through Simon at the time. And the combination of the erotic and, um, and the body here, I think clearly uh, there's more to be unpacked in terms of the relationship to those two um, particular uh, receptions that she had in, in Europe, which at the time, you have to remember that Duchamp's ready-mades had, had never been seen in this country, uh, at least not, not, in the, not in the complete manner that they were shown at this show that she saw in Germany, which Tom Doyle was in. I mean, du the Duchamp way was clearly breaking, but um, she, had a, she had a chance to see all these works that it just had not, no one else over here uh, was seeing in that quantity. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I will pass the torch. working through not only of abstract expressionism and Hesse's um, history and training as a painter, but also negotiations with her marriage, the reading of Simone de Beauvoir, lots of issues that I think really importantly bring out the, um, the substance of the work that she made between 1964 and 1965. I'll leave this up for a second just because uh, it reminds us of the extent to which she identifies these works with her body. Um, you know, in a very lewd, kind of comical way, uh, placing and the ring around Rosie, which is placed between her legs, if, if you've ever seen it. If you see it from the side, it's actually a, maybe a four-inch protuberance. It's very phallic. It's, it's very comical. It was the first of the reliefs that she started making in 1965, and it was named after a pregnant friend. So it embroiders a great deal of associations, both in terms of, of, um, of gender politics, um, femininity, pregnancy, Dada, and so forth. So I think it's, a, it's just an extraordinary image to have. And of course, the, the performing of gender um, in a way that must have she must have anticipated would be seen as somewhat in your face, somewhat absurd in the context of the, you know, all the, all the men that she was exhibiting around. Um, perhaps a little bit like Rose Celebi and Duchamp. So this is the first image that I brought. This is one of the, uh, what I really will focus on today are the mechanical drawings that she created starting in 1964, which I see as containing a lot of, a lot of important associations regarding gender. Um, the mechanical drawings initially were a process of what she hoped would be returning to painting. She became very, very frustrated with painting when she arrived in Germany in the late summer of 1964. She really strongly self-identified as an abstract expressionist painter, which I think in itself is significant. Um, a young woman artist saying, my heroes are Willem de Kooning and Arshel Gorky, and I'm going to, um, she was very ambitious, and in some sense it, it seems very 
um, significant that she would identify herself in that mode. Not many women did. Um, the, the drawings initially came out of a, an attempt to return to painting. She was very frustrated with the, her abstract expressionist process. Her paintings in the abax mode were, were very large scale. And she just didn't seem to be able to return to the kind of ambitious large scale abstractions she'd been doing in 1962 and 1963 in New York. Some of the early, what we call mechanical drawings, what she referred to as mechanical drawings, actually involve collage. And they involve her sort of cannibalizing her own paintings, as you can see here, cutting them up and reconfiguring them, which I think is very telling, um, suggesting a kind of documenting, in a sense, her frustration with painting at this critical stage. Ultimately, of course, she she moves on to sculpture. These, these facilita facilitate a transition to three dimensions rather than back into two-dimensional compositions. And that's also suggested by the collage, the kind of building up and the more kind of transitory elements of these, um, of these compositions. <clears throat> Another thing I want to really uh, draw attention to is the affinity with Duchamp and Bacabia, which Todd already did for us quite nicely. But I would mention also that the drawings that she saw, uh, the work that she saw of Duchamp's, in addition to the ready-mades, included a suite of preparatory drawings for the large glass, which I think is important. She also at Yale would have been very familiar with Picabia's work through the Societe Anonyme collection that was housed at Yale. So I think that she's looking to these two paradigms of, of Dada that, in particular, Duchamp and Picabia were, were fascinated by this sense of the kind of um, objectification of the body, the transformation of the body into the machinery of industry, in a sense, often a spoof of the uh, commodity-producing machinery of industry with these machines that, that break down and malfunction and uh, are absurd. So. I think that that is a, a very significant touchstone for the emergence of the mechanical drawings. The very fact that she calls them mechanical drawings suggests an alignment with Picabia, and who, who referred to his drawings as a dozen a mechaniques, uh, mechanical drawings. Um, Picabia's drawings were specifically female subjects often. Um, one of the better known ones is, was a daughter born without a mother uh, or a universal prostitution. And both of these, the drawings with those titles are actually machines. So I think that this sense of kind of merging or layering this notion of uh, uh, female reproductive organs or sex, uh, um, the fo sexual functions with machines is really kind of at the core of these mechanical drawings. Uh, they, they, she worked through a number of different styles of mechanical drawings in 1964 and 1965. Some of them, they become very bizarre. Some, like the one that we looked at before, are kind of instructional. They, have, they seem like diagrams. They have arrows. Um, they suggest perhaps machine drawings um, or um, other mechanical or even medical drawings. And they become more and more, I would say, bodily. They seem to suggest organs more directly rather than machines. Another exhibition that she saw in 1964 in Essen um, was a great, what she called a great drawing, uh, a great exhibition of drawings by Arshel Gorky. And I think that Gorky's drawings, um, the ways in which he's able to create a, an abstraction that limbs the body, that strongly suggests the body while remaining abstract is another touchstone for her, something that she's working with, this kind of how can I address the body but also um, not be explicit, be absurd, be nonsensical, which were significant concepts for her. By 1965, she the drawings become more sort of clear and confident. She describes drawings such as the one that you see here as a third stage of drawings, clean, clear, but crazy like machine forms, larger, bolder, articulately described. So it's weird, they become real nonsense. These drawings from 1965 are very clean outlines that seem to describe organic forms, often sacks or tubes with fleshy folds and creases 
or machine-derived devices comprised of interconnected parts. The confident rendering of detail achieves a kind of authoritative presentation, calling to mind medical diagrams of the body's internal systems or technical drawings of, or, uh, of mechanical systems. Talking to Tom Doyle, he recalls this kind of watershed moment, saying they got very sexy, mechanical, yet they're organic. And he said the mechanical drawings were a real breakthrough. There was this sense of confidence she got out of them. She really had something. She had found herself at this moment, he recalled to me. <clears throat> I'd like to also um, spend a minute talking about the relationship between these machine drawings and her reading of Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex, which was exactly contemporaneous. And there are some wonderful juxtapositions in her journals in which she um, quotes Simone de Beauvoir and then talks about her drawings in a very fluid manner. One just kind of runs into the next. So let me read you some of these passages from her journals in which she creates this direct connection between Simone de, Beau de Beauvoir's concepts of imminence and transcendence and the machine drawings that we're looking at here. Uh, <clears throat> a journal entry from November 19, 1964, repudiates the ambivalence of the earlier painterly collage technique. Quote, if crazy forms do them outright, strong, clear, no more haze, Hess continues on to note, quote, Simone de Beauvoir writes, woman is object, has been made to feel this from first experiences of awareness. She has always been made for this role. It must be a conscious, determined act to change this, end quote. A few days later, on November 22nd, Beauvoir comes up again in Hess's journals. She writes, quote, transcendence, to arise above, beyond, into another space, imminence is inevitability. She gives us the page number, 291, from Second Sex, and then quotes Beauvoir again. In boldly setting out toward ends, one risks disappointments, but one also obtains unhoped for results. Caution condemns to mediocrity. It's the same with my drawings, she writes. And then goes on again to quote to Beauvoir. Um, what woman essentially lacks today for doing great things is forgetfulness of herself. But to forget oneself is, first of all, it is first of all necessary to be assured that now and for the future one has found oneself, and she underlines the last part. I'd like to propose that Beauvoir's notions of imminence and transcendence were quite resonant for Hess as concepts that could be enacted through her art. A persistent theme in Hess's pre-sculptural work and writings is the legitimacy of her participation within the modernist tradition particularly abstract expressionism, the status of her paintings in relation to Abex as valid artistic achievement, as mature or transcendent in the parlance of Beauvoir, versus its imminence, a hopelessly embodied female expression limited to the personal and particular. The me mechanical drawings, it seems to me, determinedly eschewed caution and claimed a bold new direction for her art. Hessen notes, Hess's notes define transcendence as forgetfulness of oneself, the ability to focus on abstractions or another space, life beyond self-consciousness, insecurity, and frustration that Hess linked to the politics of gender within her marriage and her identity as an artist, also at great length in her journals. Um, a little bit more context for the drawings. Some of this, so of the drawings, some of this has already been covered, so I'll be brief at this point. But um, Doyle uh, has described to many people the extent to which Hess is drawing from the machinery of the factory that they're working in. Um, and <clears throat> so, so this is another significant point, which I'll actually flesh out in just a moment. But I'd like to also include a quote here from, from Saul Lewitt. Hess wrote to him describing this process of, of drawings, and he tells her, um, tells her to uh, let go of her insecurities. He says, stop it and just do, do more, do more nonsensical, more crazy, more machines, more breasts, more penises, cunts, whatever, make them abound with nonsense. 
But taking a look at this drawing here, you can see the kind of persistence of this sort of gear wheel shape, and we see that over and over again in these mechanical drawings. And that is actually, I think, drawn quite directly from the Scheidt factory. If I can get to my next slide here. Uh, you can see the machinery here in, in the factory from this early 20th century promotional brochure. And the, uh, you can imagine the, the gear wheels collecting in her studio and that of Tom Doyle. And uh, a lot of the drawings look almost as if they're, they're sketches of these mechanical contraptions of the wool washing machines and the, um, um, the knitting machines. This is Doyle in his studio and he described to me creating a, a large collection of the detritus from the factory that both he would work, he would work from and Eva Hess would work from. Uh, and so here he is surrounded by the, the detritus and he said that they worked actually with common materials and both collect and create a kind of store that they would draw from in their work. Uh, <clears throat> It's also notable, I think, that they were working almost collaboratively at this time. He was helping her construct the reliefs that we've seen. And in fact, some of them were, um, she used the same paints, the same enamels that he was using to paint his sculptures at the time that you can see here. They were, were borrowing and interchanging materials. She'd also use a lot of um, uh, what he called fall-offs, wood lathed pieces that he had discarded for his own work. She would attach to her own reliefs. The relief H and H that we saw, that's actually uh, the yellow one, if you'll recall that. Doyle told me that that was H and H because it was half hers, half his. It includes a piece from his sculpture, and it also refers to the brand of pipe tobacco that he was smoking. So <laughs> they, uh, the reliefs have a very richly embroidered autobiographical significance as well. Uh, to go back just to the reliefs, so I'll conclude by drawing a couple more connections between the machine drawings and the reliefs. Here's Hess in this wonderful pose, photograph taken by Manfred Tischer for the brochure for her solo exhibition in Dusseldorf in 1965. Again, of directly aligning even the contours of her body with the reliefs. The reliefs have this kind of these swelling surfaces. And the relief in particular here on the left, legs of a walking ball, um, has a very direct relationship to many of the machine drawings. And what I think is so interesting is that uh, she actually works out the subcutaneous regions of these reliefs in the drawings. Um, here's legs of a walking ball again, and you can see this kind of gently swelling surface. Um, and you might think of the exter external exterior of the relief almost as kind of makeup, these pastel tones and the very painstakingly layered um, uh, kind of brocade. Uh, that seem to suggest a kind of adornment or decoration. But there are a suite of drawings that relate to what, what perhaps happens underneath the surface, which I think is kind of fascinating. And many of the machine drawings have these interrelated parts that recur, again, the gear wheel, um, the kind of strange, almost sort of mouth-like form in the lower left occurs again and again. Um, this is another drawing that we might relate to, legs of a walking ball. And so they depict this kind of absurd malfunctioning sexuality, um, a kind of, in a sense, refusal of, of normative um, definitions and as, um, normative uh, female identity. And here's one that I've shown already in which you can see, again, the, um, that sort of mouth-like form. So a whole host of these recurring sort of evolving forms that often would get cut out and moved around. and. Uh, used almost like a surrealist exquisite corpse uh, to create new bodies, new kinds of nonsensical uh, body machines. And finally, just one last drawing to show the, although we know Legs of a Walking Ball as a relief that really has a strong emphasis on, on surface, uh, it was something that she had thought out in terms of its depths, its uh, internal systems as well. So, uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyway. um, I'm so pleased to be here and so grateful for this institution that Elizabeth Sackler has made. Am I being heard? Um, raise a hand back there. Okay. Um, 
I have uh, maybe too much to say. Um, when I was invited um, a few weeks ago, I did not know that my knee was about to fall apart, that when I read over my 20 years of notes about Eva, that they would seem to me enigmatic, obscure, and promising. Uh, but if I'd been my own dissertation advisor, I would have uh, said, <laughs> said, give up. But I, I, also, I also did not know, and here I'm so moved, I did not know that another generation uh, had come along and is represented, if I cry, don't worry about that, and is represented in this, uh, in this book. Uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am uh, to hear these voices, and while we may have things to talk about someday, um, uh, nevertheless, I'm so happy that these young people are carrying uh, ideas and images and experiences of Eva's work into the future. Um, I want to begin with this room, and then I'll explain, I'll explain why. Um, in this room, we have Eva's sister, um, whose son and ch grandchildren I met in London at Tate, uh, at Tate Modern. At Tate Modern, I thought I'll go look at the show one last time. You can't say goodbye to Art, but I thought I'll never see them again, and I'll have a moment alone. And as I walked through, I turned a corner, and there was Elizabeth Sussman standing weeping. In this room, we have an assistant to Saul Lewitt, who's sitting here, and I'll introduce him later. Uh, we have Joan <clears throat> and Reuben Barron, who have written a brilliant, brilliant essay, I don't know if it's ever published, on Eva and Samuel Beckett. And you can see in a, at a glance that through Beckett, you can get some words and concepts uh, that would apply to, uh, apply to Eva. We have also in this room, um, Eva certainly is a tragic figure, and I'll talk to Todd sometime about the dimensions of that. And we have in the room also a great tragic painter, Barbara Friedman, whose alliance with Eva would be spiritual entirely, uh, but not the less real for that. My point is that in this room now, with you, with these marvelous people, there's a mood, an atmosphere, a feeling. There's no way to preserve that. When we go on and when you tell about this later, and I hope you'll be kind, uh, you'll say, well, something, it was something in the air. There was a presence. There was an immediacy. There was something in the moment. But uh, I've lost it. I'm using that to point back toward experiences with Eva. Maybe 15 years ago, I was sitting talking with a friend about Eva, and I said, of all the people in my life who have died, Eva is the one who has not receded. I said, she's as close as this, and put my arm out. Naomi Spector was standing nearby and heard me. She walked toward me, and she said, no, Bill, she's closer than that. And that remains, for me, a problem, um, not a difficulty, or any, just it, it remains evidence, uh, I should say, not a problem. It remains evidence of equality which I'm still trying to find words for. Um, that Eva had an immediacy and a, and a presence that she did things to events which only Eva could have done. Uh, I'll back up for a moment um, on our histories. We were at Yale at the same time. I didn't meet her there. We were in the same rooms as we established later because the crits that were held <clears throat> by Joseph Albers were open to the public and I attended those uh, and sat silently and overwhelmed. In one spring, at the end of the term, a friend of mine at Yale, driving to on the Merritt Parkway, picked up a hitchhiker, a woman in a dress on the Merritt Parkway hitchhiking, and of course the hitchhiker was Eva Hess, and that was in the spring, and then in the autumn she turned up in our lives in the art world. Uh, I have no particular memories of that, except that when my wife and I had twin daughters, she was fascinated by that, uh, that a woman artist could have twin daughters. The domesticity that life went on, I think I better um, hit a swig of <laughs> uh, a, 
a, a swig of this. We knew Tom Doyle. We knew Tom before uh, he and Eva were married. Um, I feel like I almost should come to his defense, but I think there's a very reasonable understanding of him. He was an American guy, extraordinarily sensitive American guy. I thought quite brilliant. Um, not a superstar. We did not have coarse, vulgar terms like that in those days. But he was, uh, he was a Dwan artist. Though. Yes. He and was to be at the top of the time. It so. certainly was. But I'll say in relation to that, but there wasn't one, well, there wasn't one gallery. It was like a university in the sense that you would you'd go to one gallery and another, and there seemed to be a conversation going on among artists. They may not have been speaking, but a Smithson show seemed to answer or to speak to a show by Andre or Sarah or somebody or somebody else. There was a feeling, maybe it's like I'm saying the atmosphere in this room, there was a feeling of, of this conversation going on um, among the artists, among the, among the works of, among the works of art. Um, anyway, it was, you're fine with your super, don't, I won't get hung up on, on uh, Superstar. Um, anyway, sorry about that. Um, I'll come back to, uh, in 62, we had the twins. Eva was such a presence in our house that there's still a corner of a room when I can't look at that without, I feel Eva in that present there. And in terms of her demeanor and understanding Eva, um, what was extraordinary about her is that I knew a lot of funny people. I knew several funny Jewish women. And Eva was as funny as any of them, but different. And different in the sense that while she was petite, she was about 5'1", as she talked, and there would be people surrounding her, and as she talked and became funnier and funnier, and as she seemed to become larger, that is, you didn't have a sense of a tiny person, as she seemed to become larger, there was an expansion of herself so that you saw the comedy in, the, in her face, but you saw also within that the somberness uh, underneath it. She did not know, and I witnessed this, she did not know what her audience was seeing. She did not know what she was showing inescapably. Uh, the sorrow was there, but, and this is an important point in terms of understanding her in relation to tragedy, if Edie Sedgwick entered a party, that meant, hell, you don't have to be yourself, you can be anybody you want to be. Just drop this authenticity crap, uh, forget Simone de Beauvoir, and have fun. If Freddie uh, Herco entered a party, that meant think about sex. Pay attention, hold your stomach in, um, and preen. If Eva entered a party, there was a sense of now we will make an effort to be happy. I'm not sure these words are, are adequate, but she had resolved on happiness, and we were all able to share in that, to participate. Um, in that, so that um, any sadness and the sorrows were there were not part of her demeanor. She did not use those. She didn't use her personal history in any way among her, among her friends. Um, we knew very little about it, but we, of course we knew uh, the uh, large dimensions of it. When it came around to uh, going to Germany, and no one has mentioned, uh, I would hope to hear from someone uh, any of you, on the theme of language, I never understood the degree to which this woman, who at age two and a half or so, had had to shift from learning German to also learning English. The offense, the wound to the mouth at that time has to have been severe uh, to learn another language. I, I don't know the degree to which she spoke uh, German with her family, I do think that she was that Tom was invited to Germany because Tom had a Jewish wife. It was important at that time. Why do you nod your head? What? Tom was invited on the basis of his being a star. Not uh, Tom. Star. As as Lepard notes in her own book, that Ava Hesse was just thrown in as a lagniac. 
She was not, she was not part of the equation at all. She was, she was just Tom's, she was Tom's wife. That's what she was. That's what Lupard says that she was in her book. So she, she just got thrown in on the deal. She ended up, ended up being the great artist, but at the time, she was just Tom's wife. You're saying that, and I'm saying something else. I'm well, saying, I'm just, you asked me, so I'm answering no, your question. I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate, <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate that. I knew, uh, we knew uh, Robert Ryman and Lucy, I thought, extremely well. And when I, <laughs> when I talked with Bob a few years ago, he had no recollection. So um, maybe uh, back to that point. I think that uh, there's a factor that must be taken into account, although I don't know how we find the evidence. The factor is the Germanness of Eva Hess, a German Jewish woman at a time. The war has not been over that long, and Jews are very welcome in Germany for many, many reasons. I'm not diminishing anything. I won't put anything down. Uh, Tom was certainly an extremely important artist, important friend in my family, <coughs> but from our point of view, within the group of the people I knew, there weren't stars. There were many, many people. There was a huge constellation, but there was no one star. Um, it didn't work like that uh, at all. I'm sorry, I have to have another. So what I'm questioning, I don't know any facts, is uh, did Eva speak German in Germany? If she did, that made a huge difference. Um, and I think it's a major fact of her experience there that she was Jewish at a time when Germans wanted Jews to visit, and I know that from other experience. There's a story which I'm going to tell as an allegory. Um, it is that uh, Eva wanted to see the apartment her family had lived in. She did not remember that apartment. But there she is, brilliant young woman, who, by the way, studied mechanical drawing in high school. And so if you want the background of the mechanical drawings, uh, there it is. She had such training. In Germany, she's imagining, re not remembering, but imagining, fantasizing, wishful thinking, hopes, which may be false hopes always, but hopes to experience the apartment that her family had lived in. So that if you imagine a door, where's the door? If you imagine an opaque door, the imagination can go through that door. Uh, read Francis Ponge. The imagination can th go through the door. The materiality of the door does not matter. When she comes to the apartment, which she wants to see, she hasn't seen it since she was two and a half or so, and she asks to be admitted so she can see where her family had lived. She's turned away. She's not allowed to enter to see the place which she has imagined. For me, in my allegory, she approaches that door, a woman who's becoming an artist, a girl who's becoming an artist, I really can almost say, and I think that she is turned away and that she turns away as an artist, as an artist who has learned to renounce illusions, aesthetic illusions as well as deceptive illusions. I don't differentiate delusions from illusions in a context uh, like this. I can give you another kind of little allegory by me, uh, and it depends upon language. That is, in English we say a screen, a projection screen, on which there's an illusion of a movie, illusions of movement. That's one kind of a screen. Those are false illusions. They're misleading. Uh, and <clears throat> taking that and then keeping the word screen, this won't work in French, moving over to her in a factory, there's a screen, a metal screen, and she takes that material metal, metal, metal screen and she puts cords through it with plaster and there's no illusion involved with that, with that process. And what she comes out with is not seen in the same way that, a paint, that an oil painting is seen. What she's done, even though there will be an aesthetic illusion of wholeness, she scratches the surface of that illusion with the materiality. 
And so for me, her sojourn in Germany is a constant critique of false illusions, misleading illusions, and those sadly include the illusions of romantic love and of marriage with, uh, with Tom Doyle. Um, not enough can be said. He was a marvelous person that is, uh, as you all must know, it's different from being a great husband. Uh, it's a, a, different, um, a different category. Um, can we put on, could you put on something here? And then I'm not gonna keep, I wanna hear what people have to say, so I'll chuck it. Shut up. Okay, we're after the, I'll speed up a bit here. Um, when Eva came back, she was no longer with, uh, with Tom. Around New Year's um, of 1965, my wife and I encouraged her. We had a wonderful friend, he's alive and well in California, uh, who was having an opening at Pace. And we told her to go to that opening. And um, she went. Uh, and at that opening, she met Michael Todd. Um, Michael had, Mike was just back from Europe, where he had, he had a wonderful show. But the way things were, he just, nothing sold, nothing happened. He just left the art, he left. <clears throat> and he left the show and, and came back to America. Mike had, I won't say, a, I don't know how to put this tactfully. He came out of a religious background, which left him with some shame and guilt uh, about about sex, and so he would be able to say to a young woman, "Oh, I can't be a very good lover. I'm suffering such shame and such guilt." And young women were uh, volunteered to help him overcome shame <laughs> and guilt. Um, I, I, I hope that doesn't sound too cheap uh, on my part. It was not on his part. Um, and we see my, in this photograph, um, I won't describe the, everybody in the photograph. What happened in about March 1966 is that Peter Hujar, the photographer, invited friends to bring some friend, other friends, young geniuses, and they would all get together to make, to, to contrive, to devise an historic photograph, uh, the kind of those great photographs from the Surrealists in the 1920s or, or so. And so they gathered. Now, in the photograph, and of course, everybody in the photograph has a long, long story, and the photograph changed my life, which I'm hoping I won't get into. Uh, because I get interviewed all the time about a period, I was not part of the art world. I was on the margins of it, but I'm alive. And I get, I get interviewed, I'm embarrassed because I, it sounds like I'm claiming a position I did not have, I did not seek. It was, I was teaching medieval literature at Queens College. I was bringing up three children, I was caring for um, a wife. I had a life, so that, um, I'm not sure where I was on that. The photograph, um, I made a kind of moratorium. If it's 50 years ago, okay, I'll tell anything. But, and this is not quite 50 years, but I'm very close to that. I, I'll just tell you the power of photographs. The photograph changed my life. The photograph does not include my wife. The photograph brought an end to my, uh, to my marriage. So this is not trivial, and none of these people in the photograph is trivial. Now, the only person in the photograph who is pressing her weight on another person is Eva Hess. She's sitting on the lap of Mike Todd. Her hands are not touching his hands. Her feet, her weight is on him. Her, she's balancing herself with her foot. It's hard to see, I don't know what you can see here. Um, and I submitted this to my son who's an architect and he went over the, the dynamics of it. She's a little bit cantilevered. <laughs> uh, not a, and that term is huge because if you want to understand Tom Doyle, you'll understand that he worked with cantilevers and that he cantilevered a personality, which I'm not going to explain here, but uh, I'll give you my email. Uh, here's Eva then sitting. 
the only one who has brought herself, her body, to bear upon the life of another, of another person. There are many interrelations among these people. Um, can we do another? And again, the blacks and the grays did not uh, don't sort. But you can you can sort of see this incredibly beautiful woman. Um, and there's Mike with his son. <laughs> he cracks me up with his sunglasses. Um, we'll go on to the next one. Now, Eva has moved. And her movement, there are many of these photographs. I have only a few. Uh, her movement is now toward the floor. I've talked about illusions. If you look around this room, I don't trust these walls if you want to know. The ceiling could give in, um, and that screen is entirely unreliable. I don't know what's going on back there. Where's my foundation for my experience in this room? Well, finally, they're not going to take the floor away from me. I don't, I don't, I don't think, uh, anyway. What I'm saying is that as Eva went through her critique of illusions, the floor survived uh, those criticisms, and those were sharp. Um, and so here she is still. She and Mike are together. Their hands are not touching. Other people are touching hands uh, across other relationships. Uh, now, can you go home? One more. What? One more. Keep on. Whoa. Sorry, I hit a, hit a nerve. I'm sorry. Her presence is uh, just beyond. Would you like us to open a discussion at this point? No, I have to finish with this. I, I, know, I know your time. Uh, I'll do the, I'll go quick. And um, I don't apologize for feeling. Um, this photograph is, a lot of my life is in this photograph. Uh, here, m my point immediately is, here is Eva with the man, Mike Todd. Their hands don't touch. That for me is very significant. I have a whole essay about that in, 20, in 1993 in Art Space. Um, but where is she? She's on the floor. Now, if you look at the whole group of people there, it, it could have been a rectangle, that is, that, as they've assembled. But as it turns out, the way the people have gathered, it's not a Euclidean rectangle, it's an Eva Hess rectangle. And what Eva has done is so typical of Eva, and then I'll listen to other people, please, I hope. When Eva entered a group, and I witnessed these things. I watched people. When she entered a group, I may tell you something indiscreet. When she entered a group, she wanted to be within that group. She wanted to be accepted. But if the group opened and closed over her, she wanted to get the hell out of there as quick as she could. As quick as she could. And so she did not want to be excluded but she wanted to be included only on her own terms. And so with any system, she took herself to the edge of the system where she was juxtaposed to another system. Elizabeth's looking at her watch. Oh, that's my job. <laughs> that's her job. OK. I hope I stated that clearly, because it applies to the language. When she goes into titles of words which we can understand in English, but they're not English words, she was asking me constantly. I was a little bit of a, of a Wikipedia. And she would say, OK, what's solipsism? And I would explain my version of something else. And again and again, she wanted a word, a word clarified. She seemed to feel at the edge of the English language. She didn't make outright errors, but sometimes when she was tired, um, sometimes they were German locutions. I never knew where those came from. I never asked. Here, my point is the floor that Eva has, has come to rest. She's not resting on Mike as a person. She's Eva there. And with one more minute,
I communicated with uh, Mike, who was live and well in California, and asked him about Eva. <clears throat> and he wrote to me. We met on 57th Street in New York during an exhibit of my work at the Pace Gallery. She introduced, she introduced herself to me and complimented, complimented, excuse me, I'm sorry. And complimented me on the work. She seemed really drawn to it as no one else was. She invited me to her studio to see her work. I was dumbstruck by the simplicity but full sexuality of it. I immediately began courting her. That's Mike. I immediately began quoting her. Sorrowing, tragic women were always appealing to me. Sorrowing, tragic women were always appealing to me, and she had depths of sorrow that could not be plumbed. I hoped to save her from sorrow, very naive of me. She introduced me to Saul LeWitt, who was also obviously madly in love with her. I read that passage in London with Saul LeWitt sitting a few seats away uh, to read. Um, who was madly, mad, obviously madly in love with her, and saw, so, yes, so graciously, uh, with such poise, and you felt the whole generous spirit of Solow in that, uh, in the way, in his response to that. She introduced me to Solow, who was obviously madly in love with her. At this time, Eva was putting a long bandage on a large frame in her studio. It was like a winding cloth on the, mum on the mummy of minimalism. I had the feeling that she was rejecting the cold sterility of the minimalist system. She was attracted to the clarity and simplicity of the minimalist thought <coughs> thoughts, but she could not deny her emotions and sexuality, which were so powerful. Her grief was ultimately more than I could bear. Her grief was ultimately more than I could bear, and I stopped seeing her. I ran into her many years later at the Museum of Modern Art after one of her operations for a brain tumor. It was heartbreaking to see her. With that, uh, hoping that the voice of Mike survives my uh, reading of it, uh, I return to Elizabeth and uh, hope that you'll have some participation. Well, thank you all. I'm torn now about whether you have pressing questions for one another because you have never sat on the stage, you've just been in the same book, and I'd also like to have time to open this to the audience. So does anyone want very much um, to answer one of the other speakers? Todd, I'm looking at you. Uh, well, um, that was very moving, and um, I certainly, don't want, uh, did not want to underestimate uh, the, the pain or the trauma that uh, Ava Hesse might have had, or certainly had during her life. Um, my, my, my point in my essay was simply that the traumatographers have had their day in the sun, and that uh, there are other stories to tell as well. Uh, so. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you ever meant to wipe one out with another one. I, I don't think I ever did, but I, I felt the need to, 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 to answer to that suggestion. Uh, and actually, the, uh, it, it's, it was very interesting to be able to be an outsider who has uh, worked on other artists in their early careers. My, my dissertation was on Ken Noland when I was in graduate school. And I really took a look at uh, Hess's work from 65 and wanted to try and understand why she was doing what she was doing not just from the art historical influences, but, but also what kinds of things were going on. And it's great when you have a moment to go back to a formal analysis, because um, it does give you a sense of uh, different systems that she was already developing, a, a sense of seriality that maybe you didn't see so much in the work before that was more abstract expressionist. And also, what can happen when somebody is perhaps in a, in a situation where there is a lot of cognitive dissonance, where she uh, does try to go into the studio and think uh, differently, but also try to quell certain things or allow those ideas to well up in her in different ways. And 
so to look at 65 and to take uh, some lessons from that year and then see what she does, does when, she, when she immediately comes back in uh, 66 is just a dramatic uh, difference. So spending a bit more time even on the formal aspects of that work and staying, trying to sort of void out some of the others gives you a different way of seeing Hesse. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes a, a good thing to do, to just try and step back and look at the work. Well, I think it's, just, it's important to not, to, to resist the temptation to constantly conflate her art with her life and to, by, co by constantly looking at her art through the lens of her having been sick, I think does not do justice to her genius as an artist and to an artist, an artist of, 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 of lucid intent. And I think when you look at her art as, a, as the symptom of her illness, then it, it takes, a, it, I think it takes away from her genius uh, as an artist. I think great things about being able to hone in on this year is that she was, well, she was, to be sure, suffering um, the aftermath of, of trauma with her upbringing. Um, she wasn't sick. She was, uh, she was vibrant, and and there wasn't, you know, we can try to, I think, separate this out from the, the tragic history to follow. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do think it's important not to look at it as everything as a kind of evolution inevitably leading toward mm -hmm. the sort of... But not, also, this, the point of it being 1965, just sort of why we're here also, it was such an uh, extraordinary moment when abstract expression is that where pop, you know, pop was rising and, and, and happenings and, and the abstract expressionists were falling away and everything was changing and, and artists like... Tom Doyle or Eva Hesse, you know, they had to, they had to quickly, they had all grown up in, in art school, growing up uh, making art in the abstract expression mode, but you, people were, had to sort of quick, choose, quickly choose sides and sort of figure out which way, you know, their, their careers were, were going to go. And I don't mean that just in terms of a career, but in terms of their ideas. And I think focusing, 1965 in Europe was, it was, I think the time was very different than it is now. Um, just and, and the, the 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 art that was going on in Europe in 1965 was very different from the art that was available now. Whereas now, it's one world all the time. Everyone knows what's going on everywhere. Whereas in Europe, but these things, well, there's a lot of those artists. There were many. Some of those Europeans were shown at Duan, and were, you could have seen some of them, some of the Castelli. But a lot of them were not. You couldn't see a lot that was going on. She had a unique vantage onto. Uh, both this, the, the historical avant-garde through the lens of historic, through, da, through Dada and surrealism, through, whether it was meeting Merritt Oppenheim or whether it was encountering Marcel Duchamp or Picabi or talking with Harold Zeman about the legacy of, of 20th century avant-garde, those were experiences that American artists did not have. And um, that moment being 1965 is really kind of, I think, in order to understand how she got to where she was in 66, and it sounds like the work that you might have been describing there, that, that Michael Todd was describing, was Hang Up, because that, that yeah. work was made in January 1966. Mm -hmm. So that was right when she got back. That work didn't just come out of nowhere. She didn't just all of a sudden start making sculpture, uh, you know, because she's in America. It didn't just come because she was talking with uh, Saul LeWitt or with, you know, with Mel Bachner. It came out of her experiences in Germany also. So, you know, uh, a lot more needs to be focused a lot more attention needs to... Well, I think that, um, obviously, the import of your essays has been um, to detach Hesse from a whole sort of generations of people that have, connect that have been, um, you know, attached her to the group of minimalists that she mm -hmm. hung out with when she came home. Solowit is probably the most important of all of them um, to her. Um, and so you've kind of taken her away from the part and given her back to Doyle, given her back to Europe, taken her away from the sort of tragic history of her life, which long precedes her illness, I must say. Um, and so I think that's, that's very good restructuring. But however, of course, obviously, a restructuring one way doesn't prove truth and disprove everything else that we've no, had to say no, of course about not. her work. However, I want to just point out, uh, if we're talking about the sort of Europeanization of this moment with Eva Hess that it's kind of unfair to say 
that she's the only one who has that experience because after all, she is brought to Europe or this connection is made for her by Al Held. Mm -hmm. Al Held is, first of all, a Jewish artist to bring, uh, bring us back to what Bill Wilson has to say. He's also strongly connected with Europe and Switzerland through the mm -hmm. figure of St. Francis and he's a very good friend of Hesse and the Doyles and so she was, uh, she was, more, inter she was more international. And then the second thing I wanted to bring up about this Euro Europeanization that I find a little curious is that no one's mentioned Boyce um, at mm -hmm. all. And there's been so much made in Europe of the possible connections, the importance of Boyce, because this is the moment of Boyce. This, I mean, Boyce mm -hmm. is hugely important. It's more important than Duchamp. In retrospect, from, I mean, it, from our perspective that she becomes a Duchampian is terrific and interesting. And, puts her closer even to John's than we thought and so on. But I mean, she's there in Europe when Boyce is emerging. And in addition to that, when she comes back and Tom Doyle is out of her life, as Bill has pointed out, she comes into this circle of, um, through Mike Todd, of people who have known Boyce. And that is mm -hmm. in this picture, Paul Tech, who has been in and out of Europe many times and is Eva's very close friend at this moment and for several years afterwards. So to, I think, yes, we, you've disengaged her from the, from the exclusive minimalist and is great. And, but on the other hand, it's, it's, the whole picture is enormously complicated and Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But there, uh, it's curious, I mean, uh, Tom Doyle speculates that, that Boyce was an influence for her uh, in, in, I think in, it's in La Parte, but I could find no proof anywhere in all of the literature that I read, and I read a lot of it, uh, that she met Boyce or that she had even had any comment think, about it. I think and actually I, there is proof now. There's an interesting documentary team that's working <laughs> on Hesse, and they've actually established this now. Well, I mean, she, when you read the date books, she also had contact with hundreds of people. So. I mean, uh, that should, it would surprise me if she did not run it. I mean, she was very close to Dusseldorf, so it would be hard to not be aware of, of Joseph Boyce. But on the other hand, how do you measure what, 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 what that impact uh, would be? I mean... Uh, it, it, would, it would also be interesting to look at somebody like Walter. Hmm. Walter Kitt? Walter? No. Franz Erhoff Walter, yes. yeah. Because, no. because also, some people caught into some kinds of work, and other people caught into other kinds of work, and mm -hmm. perhaps that's a, a mm -hmm. she certainly, we know she, she knew them. She was close with Hans Hacke, so. who's in Ketvig at the time, and Ket, he was associated with the Zero Group, and so he was, uh, she, she probably would have known, known Uker and, and uh, Pina and Mac from, from being there, and with that proximity, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I also couldn't find, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know whether their friendship goes back to, to Europe or whether with Walter or whether it goes back to after coming back to New York. I mean, but, I think that remains, work needs to be done in terms of unpacking that. But that's, some, that's an artist that uh, Barry Rosen uh, spoke with me about, and, and he, his show, uh, New Museum, was it? MoMA. MoMA, yeah, sorry. That, um, you know, just to... The, I think what's really great about looking at 65 and is that there is a lot to be done in that era. Uh, and But what you want to ask yourself is uh, how, how does this interweave with the art that then came after it? And so to establish that fuller picture, um, even when it comes to uh, some of the uh, the iconography of the work, uh, being able to um, really unpack that as, as well and, and see how it all, all flows together. Um, Barry also said another interesting thing to me a few a little, a little while ago. And Barry, I hope I don't mind, you don't mind if I say this, but he actually did speculate on um, the issue of uh, how uh, sort of how minimalist or how post minimalist Hesse really would want it, want it to be. And I, it's an open, I, Barry, maybe you phrased it better than that, but it was an interesting, uh, it was interesting question to ask. Um, I think it's the major question, actually. I think somebody will, uh, it's a very major question. Yeah, and so I think that... Uh, well, one, one answer, uh, 
comes to mind just recently something that I read about repetition 19, where Hesse was asked whether that's the that's the the work that's in the Museum of Modern Art and the fiberglass, and one of one of the pieces is bent, they're not all the same. And she's asked, oh, are you, you know, so are you are you making are you riffing on are you making fun of minimalists? You know, but with that with this work, and she says, as if anything, I'm punning on, you know, I'm punning on myself. So I mean, of course, she leaves the mystery open as to what what the real answer is, and I think I think that probably the, who knows what the real answer is, but there's so much to say. Um, everyone in Germany, all of those artists, were discussing Immanuel Kant and ideas of purpose in art, purposefulness, purposelessness. Uh, and Eva takes up the concept of purpose, um, and I won't explore that now. I'm mentioning that uh, as part of the background. Anyone who read Simone de Beauvoir was in touch with, <clears throat> the, with those themes, and there was no way in 1965 to talk to a German artist who was not working over Kant's aesthetics. That may seem too abstract and too far away, but it's, it's as immediate as this, as this microphone. When we go to repetition 19, there's so much meaning in the prime number, uh, but more as important for me afterwards. Eva does repetition 19. There's material left over. It has no purpose. It's to be thrown away. She takes that material, which is produced from her own systems, and she makes area. She makes another sculpture out of that. If you do that history of that sculpture, you don't reach a foundation in the history of sculpture. You don't reach anything. There it is. That is, it's entirely, if I may use one word, constructivist in that she produces something never seen before out of material which she has constructed herself. There's no idealism in this. It's so close to some sentences in Wittgenstein, whom I'm rereading re him. He's better than I thought. Um, <laughs> um, when I finish with him, anyway. Um, and maybe that's enough about repetition 19, except the point there is that she learns to make out of her own processes, out of her own system. And whether minimalist or post-minimalist, I have an incredible Photocopy, uh, Donald Judd and Linda, and uh, excuse me, Lucy Lepard had a conversation. What are we going to call this stuff? And it's mar marvelous because they do not have a classification into which they could slide a work of art. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to call it. They don't have the language. Uh, and that for me is very important. There was a period before anybody said pop art, before anybody said minimal, when you had to look at that peculiarly, peculiarly individual work and study it from every possible angle and think it and think it all the way through, later you could say, oh, that's pop art or that's post-minimalist. Those serve other purposes, but until we had that language, we had the experience of the of the art, and it's that experience of the art that Eva was after an immediacy. And so that when she worked with, she worked with accidents and she liked errors and what was wrong, as she would say, because we have no rules. If something's wrong, how do we respond to that? If there's an accident, we don't have any instructions for what to do after an accident. And she saw in her life and in her art moments when there was no plan, no system, no rules of instruction. The, the response had to be improvised spontaneously uh, in that uh, in that moment, um, we'll have a lifetime. A lot, lot, we have a lot to talk about. Maybe we we should a lot to talk about. Kirsten, do you, do yes, you want I'm to say sorry, something? Kirsten. Uh, well, ju just briefly, just going back to this question of to the extent to which Hess wants to be minimal or post minimal, um, I think that she a number of times sort of calls out Solit on the, the fact that well, actually your work is not as sort of austere and systematic. It's, it's irrational, it's um, fragile, it's subjective. And I really think that the roots in abstract expressionism of both, both Hesse and Lewitt and, and a host of other minimalists is something that should be explored because in some sense they're devising a, a, a process and an aesthetic that is in opposition to almost a kind of reaction formation to abstract expressionism, but still insist in, in writings and 
in Lewitt's sentences on conceptual art, on the kind of leaving room for subjectivity and irrationality. So I just think that there's they're very clear, really two sides of the same coin in a sense, and uh, that minimalism is not really what we think it is, and conceptual art likewise, that it's become a kind of dogmatic sort of doctrinaire, um, uh, sort of too, too cleanly and precisely defined. Thanks. So I think we have some time for a few questions. I see some people. Um, is there a microphone or anything? Oh, yes, here it comes. So you're sitting right next to each other. You have to decide. That's Joan and Barrett and Ruben. Who's going to go uh, first? <laughs> who are volunteering. Um, Joan and Ruben Barron, sorry. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind words in the uh, introductory remarks. Let, let me just start out by saying that uh, Eva Hesse was both wave and particle. We do not choose. She was this and that. So in all of her work, she was a feminist. In all of her work, she was a tragic figure with personal issues. But ultimately, what becomes most important is her aesthetic evolution. And what I see there is at the end, the work becomes, as we know, progressively less formally minimal. What it also becomes is part of another current that's a current in mathematics and physics, which is going on at that time, which is the gradual em emergence of chaos theory, the gradual emergence of systems and emergent processes, complex systems. And for me, the greatness of her late work has to do with the extent to which her work be, literally becomes depicting or allowing us to see systems so that the parts in these later works, maybe starting with uh, Repetition 19, you have to ask yourself, what are the relations between these parts? And when you get through looking at the work, the parts are important, but there's also an emergent whole and she is somewhat conscious of that. There's some indication in the Lepard volume of her understanding of the relationship between order and chaos. So I think that's a, a metaphor, that's at least a metaphor, uh, which is an important way to look at her work. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question. It's clear to me that she, that she was doing painting and drawing before she left and she came back and she was doing sculpture when she came back. So it's very clear that that year was like sorbet. I mean, it cleared her palate or it did something to enable her to make this transition, to, be, to change dramatically from one kind of an artist to another in terms of the media that she used. So my question is this. I mean, she was friendly with all, all of these sculptors before she left, wasn't she? I mean, you know, the, the, the sculptors in her life. Do, do we, do you think that that's she... That's actually not, that's not true. Okay. Many, some of the minimalists she became, like Smithson she met after she came back, and others. So she was not well entrenched within the minimalist circle. In fact, she, she was only casually connected to Lepard before leaving uh, for Europe. So those friendships, my understanding, Bill would have a much better uh, understanding this than mine. My sense is that she, those, those friendships were, were built after she came back. But for, I mean, obviously, the wit, the wit is obvious she was close, but... Well, uh, let me phrase the, my question to you, all of you, is whether or not you think, or there's any evidence, that she would have become a sculptor had she not gone to Germany that year. If I could, one thing that Saul Lewitt told me, just very, very bluntly, is, <laughs> he said, she understood that the art world had changed while she was in Germany and that she had to become a sculptor because there was no room for painting anymore. So there was that. Um, there are also interesting ways in which Lucy Lepard is writing in Art International and sort of prescribing this new kind of sculpture that grows out of painting. And so, uh, you know, I certainly don't want to put too much emphasis on that kind of instrumentalist approach, but there was a sense that it was no longer really possible to paint. 
There, there also is this sense, oftentimes, that mm-hmm. women don't do sculpture. And when you think about the women who did do sculpture, whether it's Abantaku or Daner, whose husband David Smith wouldn't let him, her do sculpture when she was living with him, there is a certain sense, her taking over the materiality of creating sculpture is very, very important as a, 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 her woman's gesture. But I also, I, one of the interesting things that I keep thinking about when I look at that factory and I think about her work and the idea that cloth was produced there and women produce cloth and a lot of those drawings have stitching in it and they look like patterns and all sorts of things. And then I look at some of the later work where it's very unstructured and it's cloth that makes that happen. I make a leap that I'm not allowed to make art historically, but certainly feel in my heart about what she's doing. And so I, I, I don't know enough about Ketvik and Dereur and what's really available to her there, but I can't help it that those, sale, those pieces of cloth keep coming back in my head. So it's all those things together about the material that I keep going back to those reliefs and what she's doing there. Is there another question? Oops. Be still my heart. (laughs) (laughs) There's one. I can see that. Kristen, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit more about your research on the drawings and their relationship to the reliefs, because I thought that visually that was really exciting and interesting, this notion that um, a lot more information or material is either physically or psychologically embedded in the, in the release. Right. Um, like I I'll, can speak very briefly. Uh, one of the things that occurs to me is that she's, it, we know that the release has a, this bod- bodily association through the way that she's posing with them but then she seems to imagine interior systems for them as well, which I think is, is really interesting. The, I, I don't really want to speculate on the degree to which that reflects her own, uh, you know, she sees that as portraiture in mm-hmm. any sense. Um, but it does seem to me that there's this, it, it draws attention to the dialectic between exterior, decor, surface, dressing, makeup. She's also writing extensively to her friends, uh, Ethelyn Honig and um, uh, Rosie Goldman, whom Ring Red Rosie is named after, about the repetitive chores of housekeeping and all the, you know, just the usual sort of Betty Friedan kind of grind. Her friends are trying to get her to read The Feminine Mystique, and she won't, but um, she's clearly caught up in this sense of domestic labor, and there's this sense in which the reliefs, the kind of labor they involve is very um, anti-heroic. It's a really, you know, it's a craft, it's a minor sort of labor that suggests women's work, I think. And so that's sort of where my thinking has gone on it, is that real emphasis on decor, surface, makeup, and uh, then by contrast, these malfunctioning interior systems so um, I'm not comfortable reading it from a, through a kind of biographical lens, particularly, although one, one easily could. Um, I, I, think, I tend to think instead that it's a meditation on, on Dada and its, its legacy and a kind of transference of these male tropes to the female body mm-hmm. by a female artist, which is very significant. The idea that a, a, a woman artist is um, taking over these kinds of representations that are typically done uh, by a male artist of a female body. Um, she's representing femininity herself, I think, is quite important. Uh, you know, I, I would just comment on that. I think it's a, it's a very important gendered reading of that work. I agree with you, but can you say something about the fact that she's living in a factory that's right. in decline, that's right. itself a state of chaos, that mm-hmm. this family fortune that's been in place for oh, 200 years or more is, is, is just going to rack and ruin and in front of her very eyes and that this is 
in some way everything you say, but it's also a portrait of a of an economic system right. that's that's in decline, right. and that's Germany. And what what does that mean to her? Do you see any? of those kinds of um, questions? I do a little bit. I mean, you could take it back to Kurt Schwitter's and this notion of kind of repurposing junk also, mm -hmm. uh, taking found materials and uh, transforming them into um, sort of assemblages and uh, objects with a new identity. She was surrounded by piles and piles of string. The, the, the cord that you see on the reliefs is also something that she scavenges from her midst. So they were really about scavenging. And of course, that history of the photographs we saw, these were women uh, working in the factory for the most part. It was a very gendered division of labor. The men did certain tasks. The women did the weaving and the, the washing. So it is a kind of portrait in, in a sense of that, um, of that environment and its economics. I think we have to stop, unfortunately. Thank you all and thank you all. much. This was really wonderful. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I invite you to go up to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art and see Worked by Hand, and you will see some very glorious quilts in wonderful dialogue with the dinner party. It's really very exciting. And uh, we will be honoring uh, Julie Taymor this year on June 13th with the Sackler Center First Award. So if you're interested in coming to that, uh, I'd like to invite you there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.